Hi everyone, welcome to the Cube Studios here in Palo Alto for Cube Conversation. I'm John Furrier. We're here with a great guest, um, Balaji Siva Subramanian. Did you get it right? Yeah, you got okay. it right. <laughs> okay, VP of Product and Business Development at Ops MX, um, formerly with Cisco, doing networking. Now you're doing a lot of DevOps. You guys got a great little business there on you know, real time, you know, real time hardcore DevOps. Absolutely, so we help uh, large enterprises do the digital transformation, to be able to help them achieve that transformation. You know, Stu Miniman and I were talking about cloud native, and one of the reasons I wanted to bring you in was uh, we've been talking about cloud native going mainstream, mm -hmm. and cloud native is essentially code words for cloud, microservices, essentially DevOps, DevOps 2.0, what do you want to call it? It's the mainstream of DevOps. DevOps for the past 10 years mm -hmm. has been kind of reserved for the pioneers who built out using open source, to the fast followers, building large startups, to now larger companies. Now DevOps is turning into cloud native, where you see you know, in the cloud, born in the cloud, on-premises cloud operations, which is hybrid, and now the advent of multi-cloud, which really brings the edge conversation into, in, into view. Really a disruption around networking and mm -hmm. data, and this is impacting developers. Absolutely. And you know, pioneers like Netflix, mm -hmm. use Spinnaker to kind of deploy, that's what you guys do. This is the real kind of thread for the next 10 years is data, software is now part of everyday developer life. Now bring that into DevOps, that seems to be a real flashpoint. Yeah, so uh, if you look at uh, some of the challenges enterprise have to move, get to the velocity that they have, uh, the technology was a barrier. So with the Docker adoption, with the cloud adoption, cloud basically removed, basically made the infrastructure on demand and then the Docker really allowed the multi microservice architecture allowed the people to have velocity in development. Now their bottleneck has been, now I can develop faster, I can bring up infrastructure, but how do I deploy things faster? Because at the end of the day, that's what um, is the last sort of mile, so to say, of, of solving the, the, the full puzzle. So I think that's where things like Spinnaker or some of the new tools like Tekton and all those things coming up that allows the, these uh, enterprises to take their container-based applications in functions in some cases, and deploy to various cloud, AWS or uh, Google or Azure. Balaji, tell me about your view on um, cloud native. You look at, I just look at, the, look at the basic data out there. You got AWS, mm -hmm. um, you got KubeCon, which is really the yep. Linux Foundation, CNCF. Yep. I mean, the vendors that are in there, yep. I mean, the commercialization is going crazy. Um, then you got the cloud followers from Amazon, you got Azure, mm -hmm. basically pivoting Office 365 mm -hmm. and getting more cloud action. They're investing heavily in uh, Google GCP, Google Cloud Platform. Um, all of them talking about microservices. Mm -hmm. What's your view of the state of cloud native? Yeah, I think we, I talked to, I mean, I've probably talked to hundreds of customers this last year. And you know, these are large Fortune 100, 200 companies to smaller companies. 100% of them are doing containers. 100% of them are doing Kubernetes in some fashion or form. If you look at larger enterprises like financial sectors and other, uh, what do you call the, the Fortune 100 companies, they do actually do OpenShift. Red Hat OpenShift uh, for their Kubernetes, even though you know, Kubernetes is free, whatever, but they definitely look at OpenShift as a way to deploy container-based applications. And they, uh, many of them are obviously looking at AKS, EKS, and other, other uh, cloud form factors of the same thing. And the most thing I've seen is the AWS. EKS is the most common one. Um, Azure somewhat, and GKA somewhat. So I mean, you know the market trend that's yeah. there. Um, so essentially AWS is where the, most of the deployments are happening. What do you think about the, the mainstream IT, typical IT company mm -hmm. that's driven by IT? They're transforming. Um, just a few, I'd say about a year ago, most analysts were like, oh, people, the big cloud providers are going to be um, not creating an opportunity for the Splunks of the world and other, other people. But now with that shifting, mainstream companies going to the cloud, it's actually been good for those companies. So you're seeing that collision between pure cloud native and typical corporation enterprise that are moving to the cloud or moving to at least hybrid. Mm -hmm that it's helping the, these companies like the Splunks of the world, the Data Dogs, and all these other companies? I think there's, so there's two, um, two attacks on those companies that you talk about. One is obviously the open source uh, moment. It's attacking everything. So anything you have in IT is attacked by open source. Software is eating the world, but open source is eating software. Right, because software is easy to be open source. 
hardware, you can't eat it. <laughs> There's no open source. Nobody's doing free, free hardware for you. But open source software is gaining the software, right, <laughs> in some sense. But anyway, so any software vendors uh, are fully, uh, everybody's considering open source first. Many companies are doing open source first. So if you look at, uh, if I want to look at Datadog or Prometheus, I may look at Prometheus. If I look at uh, IBM Udeploy or Spinnaker, I may look at Spinnaker. So everything, Kubernetes or maybe some other forms of, uh, <laughs> no doubt, look at Kubernetes. So I think the um, these vendors that you talk about, one is that sec one is the open source part of it. The other is that when you go to the cloud, the the provider itself provides the basic things already. If you look at uh, Google Cloud, I was actually uh, was reading about Google networking a lot of things. A lot of the load balancers and all those things are inbuilt as part of the fabric. Things that you typically use a router or a firewall or those things, they're already inbuilt. So why would I use a FI load balancer and things like that? So I would say that I don't think they're, they're, uh, their life is that easy. Um, but uh, you know, there's definitely... All right, so here's the question. Who's winning and who's losing with cloud native? I mean, what is really going on in that marketplace? What's the top story? What's the biggest thing people should pay attention to and who's winning and who's losing? I think the, um, the, the uh, sort of the standardization of the cloud native technology is definitely helping vendors like AWS and you know, basically the cloud vendors because no longer you have to go to VMware to get anything done. Right, you know, they are proprietary software that they had and you don't have to go there anymore. Everybody can, can provide it. So the winners, I would say the customers, obviously, because now they have more choices. They're now vendor locked in. They can go to EKS or AKS in a heartbeat and nothing happens. And so customers are winners, big winners. And then I would say the, the cloud providers are big winners. Um, open source um, is really hurting some of the vendors we talked about earlier. Um, I would say, yeah, I would say the the, the big guys are the, the big guys as in- Cloud's getting cloud bigger. The, the cloud guys are getting bigger and bigger, yeah. more powerful. Yeah, absolutely. What about VMware? You mentioned VMware and you know, hinting to their proprietary. Mm -hmm. They also run on AWS natively, so- Absolutely. They're still hanging around. They got the operators, yep. but they're not hitting the devs, but they have this new movement with the Kubernetes. They acquired um, a company I to mean, do that. You know, I would say that the AWS uh, on, sorry, VMware on AWS, Essentially is that, uh, I would say it's almost a no-op for VMware in some sense, in some sense. Um, but they have to be, it's almost like a, pro, it's almost like a place to sell their, there. They used to be, uh, you know, like on-prem vendors already have the infrastructure, then VMware goes, sells to that customer A. Now the customer says that I don't, I'm not using it on on-prem server A, I'm, I'm on AWS, can you provide me the same software? So essentially, you know, number one, by moving to the cloud, um, they're essentially selling to the same customer the same stuff, number one. Number two is but once now I'm in the cloud, I would obviously peel away my workload to native uh, AWS or Google. So I think in, in the long run, I would say that it's a <laughs> strategy to survive, but I don't think it's yeah. a long-term successful. Yeah, operators don't move that fast, devs move much faster. I got to ask you, yeah. in the developer world mm -hmm. and cloud native mm -hmm. and, and DevOps kind of 2.0, 3.0, what are the biggest challenges that's slowing it down? Why isn't it going it faster, or is it going fast? What's your view on that? Yeah, I think I would say that um, the biggest challenge is obviously, as you said, the people, right? In, in, in some sense, uh, um, people have to transform. And uh, in large organizations, there's a, a lot of inertia that allows, that, you know, people, they are deploying uh, existing services the way they're deploying the services. Some of them are custom built. The guy who wrote it and they no longer exist. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they've moved on. And so the, some of them are built like that. But um, so I think the inertia is basically like now, how do I transform them over to the new model? If the application itself is getting more broken into more microservices, then it's a great opportunity for me to migrate. Uh, but if it's not, then I'm not going to touch something that's actually there. So I would say is that, um, and then technology is complex. Actually, every day we have people, um, you know, there, there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of people learning, learning, learning new stuff, but I cannot hire one Kubernetes good engineer um, if I want to try it hard, in the Bay Area at least, because it's hard. Because they're working somewhere else, right? Well, they work somewhere else, or um, the, te the technology is still early enough that people are learning in droves. I mean, that you know, don't get me wrong there, but I think it's still uh, fairly complex for them to, you know, digest all of them. I think in five years, fast forward five years, 
you'd see that that technology um, knowledge would be more, so it'll be easier to hire those people. Because if I want to transform internally, let's say I'm an enterprise, I want to transform, I need to hire people to do that. And what are the use inside. cases, what are the top use cases that you're seeing in your work and mm -hmm. out in the field in the business that people are rallying around that can get some wins, you know, top three use cases for you know, end to end you know, cloud native development? Um, I would say the, um, you know, the, the, uh, the uses, use cases are like, you know, like if I'm doing uh, any kind of uh, applic container based applications, obviously um, I would like to do through the, through the new model of doing things because I don't want to like build um, based, on, based on a legacy technology for sure. Um, I would say that the other ones are like new age companies, they are definitely adopting cloud first and uh, they are able to leverage uh, the existing models and the, the, the new models more quickly. I mean, I would say these are the two things I think is that if, there's, if I'm doing something new, I, I take advantage of that. Um, I'm not sure I answered your question. Do you think yeah. microservices is overrated right now or is it hyped up or is it? No, I think it's real, absolutely real. And what's the big use case there? Uh, it's, it's a velocity that people get by adopting microservices, right? You know, before I used to work at Cisco when there's a software release, I have planned for six months to release the software because there's so many engineers and developing so many features, they develop it over a period of time and then when they actually integrate, there's a two, three months of testing before it gets out because the guy who wrote the code probably left the company already yeah. by the time the software actually sees the light of the Give day. some data on, from your perspective, mm -hmm. you don't have to name companies, but like for the people that are successful with, um, you know, DevOps at an, op at an operating level. Yeah. What kind of frequency of updates are they doing per day? Just give some, you know, order of magnitude numbers on what is a success in terms of a... Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the great examples are something like Netflix, uh, you know, about 7,000 deployments a day, but obviously that's in the, the cre you know, the top of the pyramid, so to say. Uh, many of the uh, other customers are doing somewhere between one to two a week. I mean, you know, these are very, very good companies. Uh, this is at a per service level. I mean, I'm not talking of the, the whole application because the application may have 10, 20, 50 services in some way. So there's a lot of updates going on every week. So if you look at a week time frame, you may have 50 updates for that service. But I think individual service level essentially could be one or two a week. And obviously the frequency varies depending on. Yeah, There's just a lot of software being updated all the time. Absolutely, absolutely. Obalaji, well, great to have you in. And I got to say, it's been, uh, we could use your commentary and your um, you know, insight in some CUBE interviews. Love to invite you back. Thanks for coming in. Thank Appreciate you very it. much. I'm John Furrier here in the CUBE conversation. We have thought leader conversations with experts from our expert network, the CUBE, CUBE alumni. And again, all about bringing you the data here from the CUBE studios. I'm John Furrier. Thanks for watching.